ओके फ्रेंड्स आई एम स्टार्टिंग फाइन जस्ट लेट मी गो थ्रू द ओके ओके आई एम स्टार्टिंग फाइन ओके ओके फाइन ओके ग्रेट एनी वे फर्स्ट आई गो थ्रू सम ऑफ द क्वेश्चन इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन विच आई रिसीव इन लास्ट से वन टू मंथ्स एंड मोर ओवर वेयर एक्चुअली आई फाउंड देम एज कॉन्ट्रोवर्शियल क्वेश्चन आई हैव इंक्लूडेड दैट so in the end if you have any queries uh, you can come to me uh, you can post and accordingly uh, we will solve fine okay so let's start with the question number 1 a clinical case so what all queries i received i just uh, got them converted into some clinical scenario rectified the questions and one line queries make them in the form of question so i did some editing and modifications to prepare these questions for you so these are the very important things and in fact these are as i mentioned that these are basically the controversial questions or you can say recent updates these are the two most important thing which i'll try to cover in this one hour question number 1 a clinical case a 65 year male with a history of myocardial ischemia 2 years back for which he was managed conservatively is to be operated for laparoscopic cholecystectomy latest echo shows ejection fraction of 60% he is on regular treatment since then question number 1 and 2 are applicable to this patient so important things to note here is history is quite old Two years old and managed cons conservatively, and ejection fraction is normal, and he is on regular treatment. So more or less, we can believe that this patient is on <coughs> controlled disease. His disease is controlled. So let's see question, question number one and two. monitoring of which lead is most important in intraoperative period lead 1 lead 2 lead v3 lead v5 i know majority of you will opt for lead v5 because until very recently lead 5 <coughs> used to be considered as the best lead for <coughs> ischemia monitoring and lead 2 as best for arrhythmia so it's obviously it's not possible to have uh, Well, lead ECG. So we are monitoring two leads. So lead two, that you know is best for arrhythmia. That we all know. And as I told you, that for ischemia, lead V five used to be considered as best. However, recently it has been found that V three or even V four are better than lead V five. for detecting intraoperative ischemia so that's very important recent advancement now lead v3 or v4 are preferred over lead v5 for detecting intraoperative ischemia however if they ask you best monitor to detect ischemia that is trans 
more sensitive is trans esophageal echocardiography that is TEE trans esophageal echocardiography is more sensitive it can detect more than 95 to 97 percent of ischemic events while if you only rely on ECG still uh, there are chances that 15 to 20 percent of the ischemic events you get missed so this question can be asked in another way also more sensitive and they may give you lead v3 and another option may be trans esophageal echocardiography so of course you have to opt for trans esophageal echocardiography fine so in this question the best lead for monitoring in ischemic patient will be lead v3 not v5 so so option is c answer is c Anesthesia is best maintained on oxygen plus nitrous oxide plus halothane, oxygen plus nitrous oxide plus isofluorine, oxygen plus nitrous oxide plus sevofluorine, oxygen plus nitrous oxide plus desfluorine. Now you know that for all cardiac patients, inhalational agent of choice for maintenance is isofluorine, and you know that uh, for maintenance we are using inhalational agents, for induction we are using IV agents. So here they have asked for maintenance. Okay, before that, if I ask you induction, induction agent of choice for all cardiac patients is etomidate. So for this patient also, we will be inducing the patient with etomidate. So for maintenance, as I told you, that inhalational agent of choice for maintenance for all cardiac patients is isofluorine. And there used to be exception MI because isofluorine we used to believe causes coronary steam. And for decades and decades, we were believing that isofluorine causes coronary steam. However, recently, they uh, few years back, they said it produces coronary steam, but it is more or less a theoretical phenomena. So if deemed necessary, we can use isofluorine even for MI patient. But recent evidence has clearly mentioned that isofluorine does not causes coronary steam. So another very very important question I will say on which you can uh, expect a, another important recent advancement or fact on which you can expect a question. So isofluorine does not causes coronary steam. So making it as an inhalational agent of choice for all cardiac patients including MI. Previously it used to be excluding MI but now including MI. So in this case maintenance will be best done with oxygen nitroxide and isofluorine. Now say I change this situation and I say that this patient ejection fraction is not 60%. Here it is 60% normal. Say the patient ejection fraction say is 35%. Now, will you still be using inhalational agent? No. Because inhalational agent decreases the cardiac output. Minimal decrease is seen with isofluorine, but that doesn't mean that isofluorine does not decrease the cardiac output. So, isofluorine also decreases the cardiac output, but less as compared to other agents. Therefore, we prefer it most. However, if patient ejection fraction is normal, then any even slightest decrease in cardiac output is not acceptable. So we will not be using inhalation agent. So if ejection fraction is low, then anesthesia will be maintained with intravenous opioids. So you have to look at all the clinical situations. Like in this uh, uh, question, if they would have given low ejection fraction and there may be one, one option, none of the above. So that in, in, then it can become really tricky. So in that case, you will be going for no, none of the above because ejection fraction normal, simple. We can give inhalation agent and inhalation agent of choice even for MI patient is now isofluorine. Ejection fraction low, no inhalation agents. You have to maintain anesthesia with intravenous opioids. Clear? Question number three. A 75 year old patient who has undergone a stenting with drug eluded stent seven days back is posted for knee replacement. 
रिगार्डिंग टाइमिंग ऑफ सर्जरी पेशेंट कैन अंडरगो सर्जरी पेशेंट कैन अंडरगो सर्जरी विद हायर पोस्टपोन दी सर्जरी फॉर थ्री मंथ्स पोस्टपोन दी सर्जरी फॉर सिक्स मंथ्स दिस इज ऑल्सो वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट ऑन विच यू कैन एक्सपेक्ट ए क्वेश्चन इन एनी ऑफ द एग्जाम बिकॉज देयर हैज बीन रिसेंट चेंजेस यू नो दैट वेन पेशेंट हैज एम आई we cannot take the patient for certain period of time in immediate post mi period because the patient is very vulnerable for re mi the chances of re mi during first month can be as high as 30 30 to 40% so therefore we have to defer elective surgery now deferring elective surgery depends on the way mi was managed so mi would have been managed by three methods either conservatively or with this also nowadays nobody is using bare metal or maybe drug eluded if not mentioned consider it as drug eluded and third may be by bypass surgery so there are three methods of managing mi now if it was managed conservatively then we have to defer elective surgery for two months and here wherever i am using in this presentation wherever i am using green pen that means there is a change from the existing or that is recent advancement so previously <coughs> if mi was managed conservatively we were deferring elective surgery for 6 weeks now it has been changed to 8 weeks or you can say 2 months so i use green pen bare metal previously it used to be 6 weeks so i changed the green pen drug eluded 6 <coughs> months and why i again use green pen because it is possible that in books you see it is given that uh, we have to defer elective surgery after drug eluding stent for one year and that was true previously because previously the stent we were using were taking one year for complete epsilization however now they say the stents which we are using nowadays they go complete epsilization within 6 months and we can afford to stop <coughs> at least one antiplatelet now what is the reason why we are deferring surgery for such a long period 6 months in drug eluded because these patients have to be kept on dual antiplatelets clopidogrel as well as aspirin so <coughs> after 6 months there occur complete epsilization so you can afford to stop at least clopidogrel so we can take the patient for surgery that is the reason for deferring for 6 months if the patient is on bypass surgery previous recommendation was 6 weeks and current recommendation is also 6 weeks so i am not changing the pan fine so if managed conservatively 2 months if managed with bare metal stent defer elective surgery for 3 week, 4 weeks if managed with drug eluding stents we have to defer elective surgery for 6 months and i told you if they just mention you stenting underwent a standing without mentioning bare metal or drug eluded then consider it as drug eluded and bypass surgery deferred for 6 weeks now we can come back to our question stenting was done just 7 days back so we have and it is drug eluding stent so we have to defer surgery for 6 months that is choice d now just let me see any technical glitches or something from technical team if there is any message fine there is no problem fine that's great question number 4 26 year female suffering from pih has to undergo lscs due to fetal distress anesthesia of choice spinal epidural combined spinal epidural plus g again this is very important and i received this question from many students because i think this recently came and uh, until very recently for pih patients we were avoiding spinal anesthesia why because pregnancy induced hypertension is a uncontrolled hypertensive patient so as soon as you give spinal they have tendency to go in sudden hypotension however 
it was true even if you ask me my practice for last maybe two decades or so for pih patients i was giving a spinal and everyone was actually giving a spinal however uh, you can say recommendations were not for a spinal for epidural because i as i told you they are prone to go in hypotension however epidural is not effective for emergency surgeries because you know that epidural anesthesia take around 15 to 20 minutes to have onset and emergency you cannot wait for 15 minutes patient has to be taken immediately after a spinal while spinal onset of effect is in just 2 to 3 minutes so practically epidural was not possible and of course we have uh, so many good vasopressors with us so we are not really much bothered about hypotension we could have easily managed the hypotension so we were giving a spinal and i think majority of us are giving a spinal but now they have made it official that for pih patients also the anesthesia of choice is a spinal so again a important question so i can say again a important change that for pih patients anesthesia of choice nowadays is a spinal so question has already been asked last year i think but can be re asked in because many times you know recent advancement ask in aims last 2 3 years often they ask in uh, neat or next whatever it may be now so for pih patients now anesthesia of choice is also spinal and for pregnant patients you already know that why we prefer spinal why we avoid geo ga because they are at a very high risk of aspiration the chances of aspiration in a pregnant patient may be eight times more than a normal patient so all cesarean patients anesthesia of choice is spinal and for pih previously they were saying epidural theoretically but now theoretically also they that for pih patients anesthesia of choice is also spinal question number 5 58 year female is posted for thyroidectomy she is known hypertensive for 5 years on ibesartan regarding her anti hypertensive medication stopped immediately dose reductions are required continued only omitting the morning dose stop a day before surgery so i'll be again using green pen here why because for this question in your books even standard textbooks you will find that it is gi given that ac inhibitors angiotensin <coughs> converting enzyme inhibitors ac inhibitors that is an uh, your <coughs> enalapril captopril panidopril and angiotensin receptor blockers that is losartan valsartan ibesartan they are continued and to be omitted on the day of the surgery that was a recommendation but the current recommendation is that we have to stop them a day before surgery so again very important from your recent advancement point of view because until recently we were stopping ac inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers on the day of the surgery but now they say stop 24 hours before so this is again a recent recommendation so important from your questions point of view rest all antihypertensives you know we have to continue so rest all antihypertensives we have to continue so answer is d question number 6 not a desirable ventilator setting for covid induced ARDS startle volume 10 ml per kg FiO2 80 to 100% Plate to pressure 35 to 40 centimeter water in another one. Again, the most important topic from which you can expect a question in your uh, exam is the lung protective strategy. And definitely in any of the exam, you are going to get question on this lung protective strategy. so it's the lung protective strategy which define the outcome not the type of the mode you are using or not the type of the ventilator you are using even if you are using a ventilator costing 20 lakh rupees or 2 lakh rupees if you are going lung protective strategy 
the prognosis may remain same. So therefore, most important thing is lung protective strategy. So what are the components of the lung protective strategy? The most important component of lung protective strategy I will say is the low tidal volume. And the definition of low tidal volume is 4 to 6 ml per kg of ideal body weight, not the normal body weight. If patient weight is 150, that means we are not going to <coughs> give him 600 or 750. It will be what should be the ideal weight for that height. And there are many formulas and charts from which we can calculate, calculate ideal body weight for particular height of the patient. <coughs> Then second, plateau pressure should be less than 30 centimeter water. And why we are choosing plateau pressure, not peak pressure? Because peak pressure denotes the <coughs> pressure of the airways. But you know that barotrauma that happens at the level of alveoli. So we are more bothered about the pressure at the alveoli. And the plateau pressure denotes the pressure at the alveolar level. Then third thing is PEEP that is positive and expiratory pressure PEEP. As the name suggests positive and expiratory pressure means we are giving positive pressure at the end of expiration so that alveoli does not collapses during expiration so gas exchange can take place even during expiration but the problem you are giving positive pressure during expiration that means always the intrathoracic pressure is positive so that will increase the risk of barotrauma so therefore peep they say use minimum so they say start with minimum that is 5 cm water and titrate and titrate. So all these things are done to protect against barotrauma. So low tidal volume, keeping an eye on plateau pressure and using minimal PEEP will prevent the barotrauma. Then another thing we have to protect in lung protective strategy is protecting lung against the ARDS caused by oxygen toxicity. Because <laughs> Oxygen toxicity is very dangerous. It can produce irreversible ARDS. So we have to protect lung against hyperoxia. So sometimes in a race to a treat hypoxia, we over treat hypo hypoxia and produces hyperoxia which may be even more detrimental than hypoxia. Therefore, they say FiO2 that means delivered concentration of oxygen. Our aim should be to less than 0.6 that is 60 percent if our requirement is more than 60 percent then we have to change strategy of our ventilation and there are many step strategies we can change to reduce FiO2 uh, but I don't think that much details are either required for you and not possible to discuss also because that's a full uh, critical care management you can say so simply you can remember is that our aim should be to keep FiO2 less than 60 percent so these are the most important component of lung protective strategy. Most important being the low tidal volume, 4 to 6 ml per kg, plateau pressure less than 30 cm of water, PEEP minimum 5 cm and then titrate and FiO2 less than 60%. Now we can look at our question. Not a desirable setting. Tidal volume more than 10 ml per kg, not a desirable FiO2 at 200 not desirable, plateau pressure more than 30, no good desirable. So none of the above is a desirable ventilator setting for ARDS. Not only COVID induced ARDS, it is actually for all kind of ARDS whether it is because of COVID or due to any other reason. <coughs> Question number 7, <coughs> advantage of high flow nasal cannula, H -H -H -F -N -C -R, all except humidified oxygen, Positive and expiratory pressure, increase anatomical dead space, decrease need for intubation. This equipment really became very, very popular during COVID scenario. 
and really became very popular. I think question already has been asked in AIMS, but uh, you can definitely have a repeat question on this in any of the coming exams too. High flow nasal cannula means using high flow and high flow means you can give up to 50 to 60 liters per minute. Flow of 50 to 60 liters is a very big flow. However, this may be the requirement of the patient who is very tachypneic. So, it is normally me meeting the flow requirement. Normally, our flow requirement is our minute volume, 5 to 6 liter. But a patient who is tachypneic, Imagine that flow requirement can become 50 to 60 liters. So, if you not provide flow requirement, patient will become hypoxic, tachypneic and can arrest. So, it provides very high flow. And of course, through nasal root, nasal cannula. So, high flow through nasal cannula. So, imagine if you are using this much high flow, this much high flow continuously is there in airways. So, you can expect some peep that is positive end expiratory pressure of around 4 to 6 centimeter of water can be provided at this flow. So, continuous flow will always keep positive pressure in airways. So, we will give some peep. Then, <coughs> patient will not tolerate at any cost if these gases are not humidified. Such high flow you cannot give uh, <coughs> which is not humidified. So, it has to be mandatorily humidified. So, this high flow nasal cannula has a humidifier and gases are automatically delivered humidified. Now, it decreases dead space. How? <laughs> By decreasing CO2 in airways. Actually, no, not directly. Understand this is an indirect method of reducing uh, dead space. Actually, the consequence of that space is what? Increase CO2. So, airway is filled with oxygen. All airways are filled with oxygen. So, obviously, carbon dioxide will be replaced. So, ultimately, the consequence of that space is increase CO2. So, obviously, CO2 will be reduced. So, indirectly, we can say that space is reduced. So, now I will come back to the question. Advantage is humidified oxygen. Yes, it is. PEEP. Yes, it is. Increase anatomical space. No. Now, this I will say little. I will put question mark on this option. Decrease need for intubation. You will read this statement that HFNC decrease the need for intubation. And this is one of the most important, you can say, marketing strategy applied by companies. They were saying that it decreases the need for intubation. But in comparison to what? Like if you compare to simple oxygen nasal cannula or simple oxygen mask, yes, definitely decrease the need for intubation. But if you compare it for non-invasive ventilation, I won't say that it really decreases the need for intubation. So that was a little tricky statement. So, <clears throat> I'll say it's incomplete. Yes, if compared to normal oxygen delivery devices, it definitely decreases. But if compared to NIV, it does not decrease. So, in fact, if nothing mentioned, then I will say that it should be compared to non-invasive ventilation rather than normal oxygen devices. But here, we have already found a choice like say, in this choice, I say decrease anatomical dead space then this choice will also become correct. Then we will be choosing choice D. And I am insisting this because I have seen this question asked this way. They have given decrease anatomical dead space and decrease need for intubation. So in that option we will be choosing D. However, here we have clear cut option that it decreases anatomical dead space. So answer will be C. Question number 8, identify. Classical laryngeal mask airway, eye gel, supreme laryngeal mask airway, proceed. This LMA, laryngeal mask airway is one of the most important advancement if you ask me in equipments in anesthesia in last say uh, two decades, one and a half decade or two decades. 
because it has many advantages it avoid all complications related to intubation so we are putting it as an alternative to intubation and we have found it to be so effective method of ventilation that <coughs> previously we were using it only as a emergency procedure for failed intubation or for small duration surgeries now we are using it even for long duration surgeries in select cases so there are many kind of lmas <coughs> this is a classical lma but the advantage of classical lma is that it is not providing seal to esophagus so the air can leak from sides and there are increased chance of aspiration then we started to use second generation lma and the advantage of second generation lma is that they provide better seal so chance of aspiration is definitely less and moreover they have a separate port from which you can deflate the stomach even if air get leaked into stomach so this is a special type of laryngeal mask that is called as i gel as the name suggests i gel means the cuff is pre filled with the gel so all cuff related complications like say if this cuff by chance get deflated then this lma will rotate and can impair ventilation it can crumple and can obstruct and when you are removing this the patient may bite this cuff leading to damage of the cuff so considering all these uh, problems this i gel became popular and this is very commonly used in india because it avoid all complications related to cough and you can see there is a separate port also this one sorry from this port you can pass your suction catheter as tube and through this hole it will enter and will uh, enter the esophagus and from the stomach and you can use it to deflate the stomach so it is i gel question number 9 it is used for humidification restricting the flow of oxygen restricting the flow of nitrous oxide scavenging this actually became very very popular in the covid scenario because this is actually heat and moisture exchanger so actually we were using it mainly for humidification and how it maintains humidification you know this is a hygroscopic material so when <coughs> patient expire say patient expire so this hygroscopic material will absorb water from this expired gases and in the next breath same water is delivered back same water is delivered back in next breath so that's how it was maintaining humidification we are using it for humidification but it is an it act as a filter also and by using two hme filters you can prevent uh, covid transmission to your machine or circuits so that is why it really became popular in the covid scenario that it is actually not only used for humidification it can be also used as a filter like in this question if i use humidification as well as filter so it will include both but here filter choice is not given so we'll go for humidification otherwise it's excellent filter even against covid question number 10 this is done ease of oral intubation ease of nasal intubation both none this is what mallam patti classification and mallam patti classification is one of a very important part of airway assessment that we are doing normally you know if you are intubating oral uh, patient through oral route there has to be adequate oral opening oral mouth opening then only you will be able to intubate through oral route so based on the structure seen and that is tonsillar pillars soft palate uvula mainly these three and modified has also included fossas so based on this structure seen patient has been classified into four categories class 1 means everything is seen class 2 means there will be less structure seen so restricted mouth opening class 3 even less structures are seen so more restricted mouth opening and class 4 you can see almost nothing is seen so class 1 and class 2 obviously oral intubation will be easy class 3 oral intubation will be difficult and class 4 when there is no mouth opening so obviously oral intubation will be impossible so obviously this is mallam patti classification and nowadays as i told you we do modified mallam patti in modified mallam patti we have also included fossas 
other than fossil pillar, soft pallet, and UVL. So this is done to assess the ease of oral intubation. This equipment cannot detect methemoglobin, sulfimoglobin, fetal hemoglobin, all of the above. This is what obviously this is pulse oximeter. And pulse oximeters, even the latest one, they cannot detect abnormal hemoglobin. So pulse oximeters, one of the major limitation of pulse oximeters is that they cannot detect abnormal hemoglobin. So if the patient has any meth hemoglobin, self hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin, or for that any other abnormal hemoglobin, they will give you false values. So to detect abnormal hemoglobin, we are using co-oximeters. So co-oximeters are the special type of oximeters which can detect abnormal hemoglobins. So co-oximeters can detect abnormal hemoglobins while normal pulse oximeter cannot detect abnormal hemoglobin and this is normal pulse oximeter so it will not detect any of the hemoglobin whether it's meth hemoglobin, self hemoglobin or fetal hemoglobin. So cannot detect all of them. The following graph of capnography represents esophageal intubation, recovery of a spontaneous breath, cardiac oscillations, bronchospasm. See capnography is very very important and capnography is the measurement of anti-tidal carbon dioxide with its graph, graphy, with graph and this is very very you can say the most sensitive respiratory monitor to detect abnormal you can say uh, <coughs> respiratory complications. So normal ETCO2 is around 32 to 42 mmHg which you can say is around 3 to 4 mmHg less than arterial PCO2 and there are many you can say uh, conditions which you can diagnose like it is the surest confirmation of intubation. Since it is the surest confirmation of intubation, so obviously it should be able to detect the earliest extubation and what you will happen, what you will see in extubation that ETCO2 will become zero and graph will become flat line. See, ETCO2 or expired carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide will come out of endotracheal tube only if the tube is in trachea. If the tube is not in trachea, from where CO2 will come out. So therefore, uh, <clears throat> it is considered best, you can say, parameter to confirm intubation. And that is why it will detect extubation immediately because when the tube come out of the trachea, it expired carbon dioxide will become zero and graph will become flat line. Similarly, say if tube get disconnected from circuit, then how it will reach monitor, it will again become zero or tube got obstructed due to secretion, complete obstruction or get completely kinked, then CO2 will not be able to reach or there occur ventilator failure, apnea, no ventilation, no CO2 or even in card, it can detect cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest means no CO2 is coming from periphery, periphery, no circulation is coming to the lungs from periphery, then how CO2 will reach lungs which can come out of endotracheal tube, so it will again become zero. So you know these are the life-threatening complications which you can detect with capnography. So esophageal intubation, you will find it to be immediately becoming zero. Cardiac oscillation, just will be like it will be seen in very lean and thin patients, and presentation will be like this, just like this, oscillations. Then bronchospasm, yes, in bronchospasm, what you expect? What happens in bronchospasm? ETCO2 net value will be same but expiration is prolonged so you will get this kind of graph and that is called as shark fin pattern shark fin pattern is like shark fin now this is another graph which you see often and this is called as curare notch and what do you mean by curare notch means this normal CO2 
graph will be like this in between you can see there is a notch now what this notch indicate that patient is trying to take a spontaneous breath in between so this is a control breath means ventilator driven breath so patient is trying to take spontaneous breath in between that is called as curare notch so this is recovery of spontaneous breath recovery of spontaneous breath means effect of muscle relaxant is waning off so now it is the time to repeat the dose of muscle relaxant so b blue vaporizer is of sevoflurane desflurane halothane isoflurane vaporizer colors may be expected from you so sevoflurane is yellow desflurane is blue halothane is red and isoflurane is purple and these are the four <coughs> inhalation agents which we are using nowadays so this is obviously sevoflurane and this is desflurane and halothane I told you is red and isoflurane is purple. So blue vaporizer will be of desflurane B. Untrue. Most commonly used circuit, best for neurosurgical patient, fresh gas flow is 1.6 times per minute volume. None of the above. See, identifying circuits is important. And three circuits that you should know uh, in semi-open circuits, one is Meffelson A that is Megill, Meffelson BC obsolete, D modification, Baines which is most commonly used and E also incomplete and F a modification of E which is most commonly used pediatric circuit. So the most important characteristic of Baines, Baines is a modification of Meffelson D which is most commonly used and it is a coaxial circuit means one tube passing through the other while Megill and that is Meffelson A and Meffelson F that is Jackson Reese they don't have two tubings now, the same tubings is used for inspiration and expiration now how will you differentiate between Megill and pediatric tube size diameter like if say this is an adult size then pediatric size will be less diameter will be less fine so anyway now you can see there are two tubings here can you see this green tube passing all the way through this outer tube so one tube passing through the other means it is a bane circuit without any second thought so inner tube will carry the inspiratory gases and outer tube will carry the expiratory gases. So this green tube will carry the inspiratory gases and this transparent white tube, corrugated tube will carry the expiratory gases. So it is Baines. And you already know that Baines is the most commonly used semi-open circuit. And it is best for neurosurgical patients or for all head and neck surgeries because it is very long up to even uh, 1.5 1, 1 to 2 meters long. So you can stand well away from the patient and in head and neck surgeries, uh, anesthetists stand much away from the patient. Then fresh gas flow for Bain circuit is 1.5 to 2 times or an average you can say 1.6 times of minute volume. So all these three statements are correct. So none of the above is untrue. B. Question number 15. False statement. Use for children less than 3 years of the age. Lift the epiglottis, use in newborn resuscitation and other. Now, which is this laryngoscope blade? This is Miller. Most commonly used, you know, is Macintosh. And Macintosh is a curved blade. The blade is curved. So, this is almost straight just a little curve at the angle so just there is a little curve at the angle otherwise Miller is straight now they have simplified it so I'll use green pen for adults Macintosh Previously also we were using Macintosh for adults. However, it can be used for children also. 
but prefer for Macintosh. For pediatric, pediatric means all age. Previously in books you will find different blade for new no, newborn, neonates, infants, toddlers, different blades. All that that stand finished you can say. Nowadays for pediatric it is Miller. Which is, don't think that can't be used for adults, can be used for adults, but not preferred. So they have simplified, so you can expect a question. And many times this question has been asked. Now, simple if they ask you, blade of choice, Lanagosco blade of choice for pediatric is Miller and for adult Macintosh. Previously also Macintosh, so this is new. So now we can see the question. Now we have identified this is Miller, so it is used for children less than 3 years, yes. Lift the epiglottis, yes. That's the difference between, you know, pediatric and adult laryngoscope. That adult laryngoscope, you need not lift the glot, epiglottis. You push it, put, uh, just pull it in epi, airy epiglottic fold and pushed anteriorly, epiglottis will be automatically lifted. But in children, you know, epiglottis is large and leafy, so has to be directly lifted. So, so can be used for newborn resuscitation, yes. So, none of the above is a false statement, all are the post about Miller. Used in obstetric patients, pediatric patients, old age patients, gynecological patients. This is what Antonox, which is a mixture of 50% oxygen and 50% nitrous oxide. So that is why color of the cylinder is blue with either fully white uh, uh, shoulders or white and blue quadrants which indicate oxygen fine so 50 percent oxygen 50 percent nitrogen and in anesthesia we are using it for labor analgesia painless labor although the most preferred method for painless labor is lumbar epidural but as an alternative if lumbar epidural is not possible or not working you can use antonox inhalation and you can see this mask Patient will directly put this mask and keep on inhaling. So it is used for labor analgesia in obstetric patients. Antonox. Question number 17. Agent of choice for in induction in pediatric convulsions compounded in another book. So this is sevoflurane, which you know is the inhalational agent of choice for induction in pediatric patients. It is the inhalational agent of choice for induction. In pediatric patients. Now, if you don't are not available with sevoflurane, second choice will be halothane. You know that isoflurane and desflurane they can't be used for induction. Why? Because they have irritating induction. So, in inhalational induction, first choice is sevoflurane. And second choice is halothane. Then it can produce convulsions. Although case reports are very rare and that is only seen in pediatric patients where we are using it in high concentration for induction. So it can cause convulsions but as I told you it is very rare. And with the soda line there has been case reports of compound A production. However, nowadays they say compound A production is also more or less theoretical. So, all these are true statements. So, again, none of the above. Contraindicated in pneumothorax, tympanoplasty, diaphragmatic area, all of the above. What is this? Now, first you have to identify, and this is nitrous oxide. And that's how they ask questions. They will not give you direct questions. So, at least it will combine two facts that you have to identify the cylinder that nitrous oxide is stored in blue color cylinders and nitrous oxide you know is 35 times more soluble than nitrogen so if there is any air filled space closed space like say pneumothorax pneumomediastinum pericardium, giving nitrous oxide can turn out to be a fatal event imagine for one mole of nitrogen removed will be replaced, one mole of nitrogen removed will be replaced with 35 molecules of nitrous oxide. So imagine how, far, how fast a small pneumothorax can get converted into tension pneumothorax. 
So absolutely, absolutely contraindicated for pneumothorax. Then it should not be used for tympanoplasties because middle ear also has air and ingress of nitric oxide will increase the middle ear pressure and that will lead to displacement of their graft and failure of surgery. Then it should not be used for intestinal obstruction and for the very same reason it can't be used for diaphragmatic hernia because in diaphragmatic hernia the gut is already in chest cavity and nitrous oxide will lead to expansion of the gut that will lead to further compression of lung further worsening the atelectasis and hypoxia. So contraindicated in all of the above conditions. Can reverse all except vicuronium, rocuronium, atracuronium, pancuronium. This is pseudomatrix. A recent or a new, not too new, but you can say uh, comparatively newer reversal agent for muscle relaxation. And the best part of this uh, <coughs> sugar medex is that it can reverse very deep block and effect is immediate, very fast acting, immediate reversal. And like neostigmin, it does not act by increasing acetylcholine. So acetylcholine related side effects that we see with neostigmin, they will not be seen with sugamedex. Otherwise, you know, with neostigmin to block muscarinic effect, we have to give anticholinergic. So there's no need to give anticholinergic. But the disadvantage is that this sugamedex, one, it is very expensive. There is a risk of anaphylaxis. And moreover, it can only reverse the steroidal kind of compounds. It cannot reverse the benzyl isoquilones. So in this question now nowadays that's an issue. They always ask you question which have at least two or three facts and you have to combine and then you have to answer. So one thing you have to know is that one among these which is steroidal and which is benzyl isoquilone. And second fact you have to know that sugar medex cannot reverse benzyl isoquilones. So among these you know that benzyl isoquilone is atraculium. So obviously sugar medex cannot reverse the benzyl isoquilone, so cannot reverse atraculine. That is how questions are asked nowadays. All questions at least will combine two facts, sometimes maybe three facts. Question 20. For the following situation where there is one resuscitator, the compression to ventilation ratio should be 30 is to 2, 15 is to 2, 30 is to 1, 15 is to 1. Now, there is a very important change in 2020 AHA guidelines. So I have included this question. You know, when you are doing CPR, you are doing CPR under two situations. Without advanced airway. And with advanced airway. Without advanced airway means you are ventilating with bag and mask or you are only doing cardiac massage. You are means you are doing uh, ventilation uh, with bag and mask. With advanced airway means you have already intubated the patient. Without advanced airway, now the situation may be you may be single or you may be two resuscitators or the patient may be pediatric or patient may be adult. If you are a single resuscitator, then the ratio will be 30 to 2. Either you are resuscitating a pediatric patient or resuscitating an adult patient. But if you are two resuscitators, then the ratio will become 50 to 2 for pediatric, but for adult it will always remain 30 to 2. Now, with advanced airway means if you have already intubated the patient, then you know that com then compression rate for both pediatric and adult will be compression will be 100 to 120 per minute for pediatric adult irrespective of the number of resuscitators compression will be 100 to 120 while breathing for pediatric that's an important change so I'm using green pen will be 20 to 30 breaths per minute so breathing 20 to 30 per minute for pediatric while for adult it still remains 10 per minute no change. While before 2020, so this is 2020 AHA guidelines. 
Before that, even for pediatric, breathing rate used to be 10. But once, but now they have changed it to 20 to 30 per minute. So, with advanced airway, what does mean? That one person will continue compression at a rate of 100 to 120 breaths per minute. And the second person will give breath by watch. If it is an adult victim, then he will go give one breath after every 6 seconds, means 10 breath per minute. And if it is a pediatric victim, a patient is pediatric, then he will be giving that breath after every 2 to 3 seconds, 20 to 30 per, per minute. So again, very, very important from your questions point of view. So this is the most important change, I will say, which has happened in 2020 guidelines. So here, look at the question. There is one resuscitator. So compression ventilation ratio will be 30 to 2. For one resuscitator and without advanced airway, ratio will be 30 to 2 even for pediatric or adult and here it is an adult victim. Now, allergy in immediate perioperative period is due to depolarizing muscle action, antibiotic, latex, non-depolarizing muscle action. Here I'll use green pen because all your books you will see it is given that the most common cause of allergy in uh, anaphylactic reaction perioperative period mentioned is muscle relaxants. And that was true until very recently. But recently th there was a British study before it was a French study which was showing muscle accent to be the most common cause. But recently we have one British study which says that antibiotics remains the most important cause of anaphylaxis in perioperative period. So again important from your question's point of view and there is a major change because in all your MCQ books you may find answer being mentioned is muscle relaxants but now antibiotics. Cuff tube can be used in all age group except premature, newborn, neonate, none of the above. This is again a very important change happened few years back. You know that before uh, we were not using cuff tube up to 10 years because we are believing that subglottic is the narrowest part. So cuff can cause subglottic edema or tracheal diameter is narrow. So cuff can cause tracheal wall edema and can cause post-op obstruction. But all these things has been unfounded. There is no difference in subglottic uh, edema or tracheal edema whether you are using cuff tube or uncuffed tube. Therefore, now cuff tube can be used at all age groups. So now cuff tube can be used at any age. Except prematures, you can say still they are saying that prematures you can avoid, but that's a very small fraction. So you can say pediatric all age groups we can use cuff tube. So now we can look at the question. Age group except can be used in premature. Yes. Newborn. Yes. Neonate. Yes. So all age groups even newborn or neonate nowadays you can use cuff tube. So D. A patient was brought to casualty with a lacerated wound that required suturing. The wound was cleaned with and antiseptic precautions were taken before bupivacaine infiltration was given. Which of the following nerve fibers are most sensitive to the effects of the infiltration? A gamma, B, C, A alpha. Now this I will say is the most controversial question. And I will tell you reason for one. You know that nerve blocks may be peripheral nerve blocks or central nerve blocks. Or central axial block. Central axial blocks means spinal and epidural along the central axis. So, for peripheral nerve blocks, the sequence of blockage is A gamma, A delta, then A alpha or A beta, you can say simultaneously, and then B and then C. Even if they don't give, give you the uh, subclassification A of A, then it will be also A, B, C. While for central axial blocks, there are many regions which affect the sensitivity. So, we will not go in that much details. For central axial blocks, first to be blocked is B and then A and then C. And this is the region for controversy, whether it is central axial blocks or peripheral nerve blocks. So, if they give you peripheral nerve blocks clearly, then it is ABC. If they give you central axial blocks, then it is BAC. But sometimes if they don't give anything, and if they don't give anything, then it will be, you consider it as peripheral nerve blocks. Now, like in our question, they have given already, uh, it is peripheral, infiltration means peripheral. So, 
first to go will be a gamma a appropriate size of endotracheal tube for six year child is now why include this question because previously you will find there were different formulas for uh, children less than 6 years and different formula for children more than 6 years but now it is a single formula and that is h which is in years divided by 4 plus 4.5 single formula for all ages 1 to 14 years so here we can see there are 6 years so 6 divided by 4 plus 4.5 6 by 4 3 by 2 1.6 plus 4.5 5.1 means 5 number C A 30 year old patient underwent humerus plating under supraclavicular brachial press block surgery lasted for 2 hours and patient was kept in recovery for 1 hour Now anesthetic is to send this patient towards toward not towards toward which of the following he will expect return first motor sensory autonomic all recover simultaneously Again, there is a region of controversy and the region of controversy is again where that is peripheral nerve block and center muscle blocks. For peripheral nerve blocks, the way they go is first to go is motor, then is sensory and then is autonomic. While for central nerve blocks, first to go is autonomic, then sensory and then motor and the recovery is in a reverse order means for peripheral nerve block first to recovery is autonomic then sensory and then motor while for central nerve block first to recovery is motor then sensory and then autonomic so again if they clearly mention then go like that if don't mention then consider it as peripheral nerve block so here it is a brachial plexus block means peripheral nerve block and there was first to recover. So, first to recover will be autonomic. C. I think that should be all about. Uh, uh, let me see if there are any queries. You can post your queries. So, for maintenance, any query? No queries? There are quite number of students I can see. Okay, I'll just wait for one minute. If there is no query, then I'll close the session. Okay, so I don't think there is any query by any of you. I'm not seeing any uh, message in my chat box. So, okay, friends, I am just closing the session. Any query, if you later also have no problem, you can always post on our, your uh, medical Facebook, Igor Kul. We are always ready to help. Fine. Okay, then, I am closing the session. Thanks and, and my best wishes. Okay, then, I am stopping the streaming. Okay.